Good morning. Bonjour, bon dia. Ready? Good. Again, my name is Dr. Joel Amebo. I am the moderator for this session, session five, cyber threats. Uh, yesterday's session, session four, addressed transnational organized crime in Africa. I'd like to start this morning's presentation with excerpts from uh, a spotlight from one of uh, the presenters. Uh, on, uh, you have it on the syllabus. It's uh, Africa's Evolving Cyber Threats by Dr. Nate Allen. It was published a year ago. He states, malicious cyber activity is often driven by financial motives. Cybercrime is of central concern to African business community, which is in 2017, lost an estimated 3.5 billion to cyber fraud and theft, and consistently ranked cybercrime as one of the most top threats faced by the continent. Uh, in the same article, Dr. Nate Allen notes that the lack of knowledge of cybercrime or cyber issues has contributed to a lack of effective regulation and oversight while amplifying opportunities for abuse. So we're here to learn more about cybercrime uh, on the continent. So the objective for this session, to explore how the spread of information and communication technology in Africa is affecting threats from espionage, critical infrastructure sabotage, organized crime and armed conflict. The second objective is to access national, regional and international approaches to managing cybercrime and cyber threats on the continent. The third objective is to discuss the challenges faced by African security sector actors in responding to cyber threats and challenges. To do that, we have two seasoned experts. Uh, let me introduce them quickly. We have Dr. Nate Allen and Dr. Inima Ifiani Ajufo. Dr. Nate Allen, it's a colleague here at the Africa Center. He's an assistant professor for security studies, responsible for overseeing a program on uh, cybersecurity, peace support operation as well. His work focuses on cyber issues, emerging technologies, civil military relations, and regional security partnerships across the continent. Prior to joining the Africa Center, uh, Dr. Allen was a policy advisor at the US Institute of Peace Task Force on Extremism in Fragile States. He also worked at the US Department of State's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations for the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committees of the US House of Representatives. Uh, Dr. Allen's research has been published in leading policy journals and newspapers. Uh, he holds a doctorate in international relations and African security studies from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, a master's in development studies from Princeton University, and then a BA in political science from Swarthmore College. Let me introduce the second panelist. Dr. Niema Fianyu Ajufo is an associate professor of law and the head of law at Beckham Hampshire University in the United Kingdom. Her teaching and her research interest relates to the intersection of law and technology, including the governance of emerging technology, cybercrime, digital rights, and rule of law in cyberspace. She's also a professor of law and technology at Swansea University in the United Kingdom. She holds a bachelor of law degree, a master of law in international information technology, a master's in African studies and a doctorate of law in international law. She also holds a postgraduate certificate in academic practice and is a fellow of the higher education academy. She's currently, she's currently serving as the vice chairperson of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group and a member of the International Law Association Working Group on Digital Challenges for International Law. Uh, in 2020, she was named among the 50 individuals leading legal information innovative uh, situations in Africa at the Africa Legal Innovations Award. So we've asked Dr. Nate this morning, he'll be our first presenter, uh, to discuss the following questions. How is the spread of information and communication technology affecting Africa's security landscape? What are the continent's most significant cyber-related threats and challenges? He also go over some of the drivers of cyber-related threats and challenges on the continent, and also discuss some of the continental and international commitments and a convention to address such threats and challenges. The third point he'll cover will be to see how the extent African government and security sector officials are addressing these cyber-related challenges and what are the key challenges 
security sector actors face and how they can overcome such challenges. Dr. Uh, Ajufo will discuss the following as well. Uh, she will start with giving a complex uh, understanding uh, 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 the complex nature of cyber related threats and discuss the role security sector actors like yourself can play as part of a broader multi stakeholders approach to address African security, uh, cyber security related challenges. She also go over the level of cooperation. We've been discussing cooperation in all our discussion group, cooperation and coordination. She will go over the level of cooperation and coordination in addressing Africa cyber related threats and challenges and how to improve such cooperation and coordination. The key question she will address at the end is to see how African security sector leaders can do now in terms of leadership and policies to address some of these uh, challenges that they'll be discussing further. So without any uh, uh, comments, let me give the floor to Dr. Nate Allen to start. Dr. Nate Allen, you have 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I'll be the, uh, the timekeeper. Once you're done, Dr. Uh, Ajufo will take over from you. Thank you very, very much for that kind introduction, Dewell. It's an honor to be here to address you all on Africa's cyber threats and challenges. My biggest regret is I'm not there in person, but I look forward to hopefully correcting that beginning next week and to have uh, detailed discussions with, with many of you over these and related African security issues. So I'm gonna give it my talk today by just trying to answer briefly a simple question. And that is, why should you as African security sector practitioners care about cyber threats? The answer to this question is not after all obvious. You can't touch or taste cyberspace. To date, cyber attacks have rarely if ever resulted in direct physical injury or harm. Analysts have long warned of an apocalyptic cyber war that has yet to materialize. So again, as security sector actors in the world's least digitized region facing very real violent threats that you discussed yesterday, why shouldn't cybersecurity and cyber defense related questions be relegated to IT engineers or economists? My answer to this question is simple. The spread of information and communications technology has already led to a fast evolving array of security threats and challenges everyone in this room should be concerned about. And over the long term, is likely to have as significant strategic consequences for geopolitics, conflict, and warfare in Africa as the horse, as the gun, or as gasoline. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please, if, we, if, we're, if we're showing my slides. Um, the main reason this isn't so widely recognized is because we live in an era where digital technology is still young and maturing. Um, it took hundreds of years for the firearm to displace the longbow and pole arms uh, in becoming the weapon of choice for uh, for, in modern, for modern infantry. And um, in just the same way, um, uh, it would just as it would be folly to judge the strategic impact of the gun uh, by comparing the matchlock rifle to the longbow, where it was in many cases an inferior weapon. Um, today's digitally enabled inventions um, are still, have still have quite a ways to go before they are fully integrated into military operations, strategies, and, and tactics. Um, you know, you can see here that, that, that uh, you know, certain many digital inventions that are in the process of transforming many, many aspects of our daily lives are very, very young. The World Wide Web is 30 years old. The iPhone is 15 years old. We're just progressing to the point where we are getting things like computer assisted targeting in firearms and drone swarms, which use artificial intelligence to cooperate and, and coordinate with one another uh, in order to, for, for military purposes. So I'm delighted to be with you today to unpack some of these threats and challenges, and I'm going to do it basically in, in three parts, as Joel mentioned at the beginning of his talk. First, I'm going to tell you, we'll talk a little bit about what cyberspace is and its broader strategic significance for African security sector actors. Uh, then I'm going to get really concrete and talk through four very specific kinds of cyber-related challenges and threats that we discuss in the article that Joe, Joel mentioned. And then I'm going to briefly talk about the, the state of government, security sector, and international responses, which I hope will set things up very nicely for Dr. Ajufo, who is really, really an expert in this area. So for first of all, what is cyberspace? You know, the first and most straightforward way to think about cyberspace is simply as the spread of information and computer networks. Um, the Geneva Center for Security Governance defines cyberspace 
as an environment created by both physical and virtual components where data information or communication is stored, modified, or exchanged. Um, and when we think about the threats and vulnerabilities specifically of information and computer networks, there are technically actually three kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, there are vulnerabilities or attacks that compromise the confidentiality of information stored in a network. So using a keylogger to steal sensitive data, um, that, is a, that is a violation in, in confidentiality. Second, there are attacks that compromise uh, access to information networks. So something like the shutdown of physical infrastructure or, the, um, or using a denial of service attack to prevent somebody from accessing a website or a banking account, that is a denial in access. And finally, there are attacks on information network in integrity, where you're using malware or a Trojan or a worm to manipulate a file, or as in the case of Stuxnet, cause a nuclear centrifuge to spin out of control and, and sabotage a potential system. These violations in confidentiality, integrity, and access are what is known as the CIA triad. And this is really the core of what cybersecurity experts and professionals consider to be their work. Um, so the simple, straightforward implication of thinking about cyberspace in this way is that the more we all become dependent upon computer networks, the more vulnerable we become and our systems become to these kinds of computer-based attacks. And this is of obvious concern to African security sector officials because internet connectivity in Africa has increased from a negligible amount, so to speak, in the early 2000s to between a quarter and a third of the continent today. And by the end of the decade is projected to be as much as two thirds to three quarters of the population of Africa will be internet users. So as digitization, inc as digitization increases, so will the number of people that are vulnerable to these types of computer-based attacks. Um, second though, I think it's really, really important we need to think less of cybersecurity issues and cyber threats directly as a result of the vulnerabilities in information networks. And actually, we can go back to the previous slide. Uh, th that'd be great. And more thinking about cyberspace and information technology as an enabler of other kinds of technologies. We go back, back, back two slides, please. Um, um, so, you know, information technology isn't exactly like the firearm. It's not exactly like the nuclear weapon. It's what's known more as an enabling technology. It's like steam power or electricity. Um, it's a technology that by drastically decreasing the cost of information, collecting and storing information, uh, is, enabling, uh, is enabling a host of other related technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, mobile phones, drones, and small cubic satellites. And it's becoming more and more integrated into all kinds of the technologies that we use today. And if we really wanna understand what cyberspace is going to do strategically, we have to think about how these kinds of technologies are affecting the global distributions of power. Um, what connects many digital technologies is that they are cheap and very rapidly diffusing. Right? The cost to design a piece of malware or an algorithm is mostly an intellectual one. And once created, it can costlessly diffuse. This means that African actors and African states in particular have opportunities to acquire, adapt, and use digital technologies in ways that it might not be possible with some more traditional military or strategic types of technologies. Okay, so that's the broad view about what cyberspace is doing to strategy, geopolitics, conflict. Narrowly, what should you be concerned about? I'm going to get real concrete here. Four kinds of threats. All right. So first, and it's something that now we can go to the next slide first. And this is what Joel mentioned earlier in his talk is the threat you probably all are pretty familiar with. And that comes from organized cyber enabled crime. Um, and I would say that there are three ways in which cyberspace is changing organized crime in Africa and elsewhere. It's leading to new forms of organized cyber crime that commit fraud and extortion. Um, it's changing the second first. Second, it's changing networks and markets for more traditional organized crime, like drug trafficking, arms sales, and, and human smugglers, often changing the buyers and sellers involved through tools like social media or other the dark web or other uh, internet enabled forms of communication. And finally, uh, the spread of cryptocurrency and mobile money is really beginning to change how organized criminals within and without Af out Africa are financing themselves. You know, think of something like ransomware, which demands uh, cryptocurrency in exchange for uh, holding your resources hostage and then demands a cryptocurrency form of, of payment. Um, to give you a sense of how rapidly these types of threats have grown, 
Um, I'd like to recall an observation by a former Cote d'Ivoirean defense official, Stefan Conan. Who, who spoke at one of our most recent uh, webinars on organized cybercrime. I think this is linked in one of the readings. And he observed that at least in Cote d'Ivoire, there are virtually no in-person bank robberies anymore, mainly because mobile money accounts now vastly outnumber brick and mortar accounts. And as a result, the business of fraud and extortion has now moved online. In fact, I think shortly after that, I heard a few months later, an Ugandan official say something very, very similar. And what this means is you're seeing the, in the emergence of entirely new forms of criminal networks. Uh, for example, like business email compromise groups, which are based in Africa, but also have, 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 have um, cells in, in places elsewhere that managed to steal, uh, one FBI estimate said $46 billion um, over the past five years from businesses, governments, organizations, and individuals in Africa and beyond. If that's, and that, that, that would put it very much on par with other major organized crimes in Africa, like drug traffic, like, uh, like uh, arms trafficking and, and natural resource crime. Okay, the next threat, um, the, most, the, most, the most tech physically damaging form of threat comes from critical infrastructure sabotage. It's possible to use malware to attack the integrity of information on a computer network, They're like the I and the CIA, as I mentioned earlier. And at times, this can result in physical destruction. Um, this is often the most technically difficult type of computer-based attack, but it, and it was previously mostly committed by state-based actors. You think of the Stuxnet program that sabotaged Iran's nuclear program in 2007, uh, Israel spoofed Syria's air defense network. Those are examples of, of cyber sabotage. But unfortunately, because of the proliferation of more and more sophisticated malware like ransomware, um, type forms of sabotage are becoming increasingly common as a result of criminal activity as well. And I think that the biggest example of this we know of to date in an African context was an attack that occurred in 2021 on Transnet, which was a South African uh, uh, state-owned port operator that was responsible for about 60% of the container shipping in the entire Southern Africa region. And there was a, an attack by, uh, I believe, an Eastern European-based ransomware group that affected Transnet's uh, Navis port navigation software, which basically caused all, all of operations to cease at the port of Durban and a couple of other major ports in Southern Africa for about 10 days. Um, the, 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 uh, the estimated damages of this attack were in the tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. And I, I read an estimate from one economist that had they been able, had they not been able to get the systems back up um, as soon as they did, had the attack lasted a couple of weeks longer, uh, they would have shaved percentage points off of the entire Southern African region's GDP. So the more digitally dependent you become, the more vulnerable to these types of attacks you are. Third threat comes from cyber-enabled espionage, which is where malicious actors use malware or create backdoors into a network's physical infrastructure with the intent of stealing sensitive information. Um, that's violating the confidentiality of, of, of information in a computer network. You know, and until recently, and I think I really remember this was uh, mentioned, I think, in the first session we had on conflict, uh, the most publicized espionage concerns are centered around China, particularly its use of its uh, as a supplier of physical and network infrastructure to attack the African Union. However, if the, if the story of the 2010s was really about African vulnerabilities to foreign espionage, which I think are still very, very real, I think the story of the 2020s is going to be the proliferation of cheap malware, surveillance technologies, and open source intelligence techniques um, available from all kinds of suppliers and resources, really fundamentally transforming the business of espionage uh, in Africa and, and elsewhere. You know, and I think one really, really good example of this concerns the recent revelations surrounding the spread of the NSO group's Pegasus malware, which is a, a no-click form of malware that basically can infect a mobile device without so much as without any action on the part of, of the user. Um, while a lot of the, uh, the coverage of this event was on its human rights concerns, um, according to the forensic analysis conducted by independent reporting, 600 of the 1,000 numbers that were revealed to be compromised by this software belong to government officials, cabinet secretaries, and heads of state, um, including a few in Africa. Um, we also learned that a few countries in Africa were what are known as operators or users of, of Pegasus malware and were using them to spy on fellow African nations and other countries uh, across the world. And I'll just I'll just state that, that well Pegasus is the sort of I think the Cadillac of of, of um, 
of commercially available malware or was, it's one of only a number of, of similar types of products that exist. So this is probably only the tip of the iceberg. Fourth and final threat is what I would call cyber enabled combat innovation. And this is the use of digitally enabled technology to facilitate organized violence through changes in recruitment, organization, command and control, and combat strategies and tactics, right? Um, and we see this in a, in a variety of ways. I actually think that, that in the conflict section, there was a really, really interesting slide that showed the increase in remote attacks from the year 2000 to today, where now they comprise, it was around, I think, 10% of all attacks that you're getting in, in, in conflict-related database. Remote attacks are cyber-enabled. They're things like remotely improvised explosive devices, uh, drone attacks, airstrikes, those kinds of things. We're seeing warfare become more and more remote, as I think a really, really good illustration of, of this. Um, one thing I want to get across, though, is you often hear, I think, very hot takes about information technology inherently benefiting either state actors or insurgent groups in various ways. And really, it's less about information technology benefiting one actor and more specifically about how that is used. And one example I want to hear is, would be, would be um, the Somali insurgent group who I imagine you discussed a lot yesterday, um, Al-Shabaab. You know, Al-Shabaab is well known as being one of the early pioneers in the use of social media and information technology among the world's terrorist and violent extremist groups. It famously uh, live tweeted a devastating 2014 attack against Kenya's Westgate Mall. Um, but that's not the end of the story, right? Um, shortly after that attack, uh, Al-Shabaab and other violent extremist groups were deplatformed from Twitter, Facebook, other platforms. A lot of its key leaders were killed, um, likely as a result of having their mobile, uh, their phone locations monitored through their mobile devices. And there was a period after that attack where Al-Shabaab forswore the use of internet completely in the territories it's controlled. And I think what we've seen happen since then, given that the threat from Al-Shabaab very much persists, is ICT and information technology, cable stations, mobile phone operators, social media really become more an area of contestation than offering a clear strategic advantage to one side. Um, and as we've learned, I think particularly looking from lessons over the past 20 years, having a technological edge does not guarantee a victory in, in combat. And insofar as information technology removes combatants from a clear understanding of what's happening on the ground, it can actually be a source of confusion and friction. And I think African armed forces, rather than necessarily always pursuing the latest, greatest, most interesting technology, often that are supplied by, by, by Western partners, really needs to think about both the advantages and disadvantages of technology and technology dependence. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want to become reliant on a technology that is expensive and not easily serviceable. Um, and might not be suited to the types of wars you're fighting. You know, much of Western investments in technology over the past 20 years have favored, um, focused on limiting casualties and remote warfare and not building uh, basic security force institutions or engaging with the politics of a community for a sustained period of time. Those are things we know we need in order to win in, um, in, 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 in asymmetric war and in, in, in countering insurgency. Okay, so I'm going to spend the last few minutes of my talk talking about the policy response uh, before turning things over to my colleague Nena. So, next slide. So, what is the what is the policy response across Africa look like? Well, on the one hand, you can make a case that there, there are lots of challenges. Most cybersecurity related incidents in Africa go unreported. Um, most African countries have yet to have either a national cybersecurity strategy or computer emergency response team, which is a group of, of technical professionals that are responsible for troubleshooting computer, major computer security incidents. Um, but I think there's actually really, really a lot of nuance. And there are some African countries, in fact, seven African countries, uh, Morocco, Egypt, um, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, um, Tanzania, and I am missing one off the top of my head, and Senegal who are in the top 51 uh, most committed to cybersecurity, according to the Information Technology Union's latest index. And there are some African countries, I won't name names, who don't have much internet penetration, who don't have much of a digital policy, uh, so to speak. Um, that being said, there are very significant challenges, even among Africa's most cyber mature countries. So this is a, a, a 
a chart from research I did with Abdul Hakim Ajijola, who is the African Union's uh, cyber sexual group chaired, and we looked at all the countries that had national cybersecurity strategies, and we looked at what we thought were the practical elements that were most likely to lead to their successful implementation. We, we, we defined five that included a threat assessment, a plan of action, a timeline, a clear assignment of responsibilities across agencies, and then a dedicated resource allocations. And what we found is among these 17 countries, while most had assignment of responsibilities and a plan of action, um, uh, only a few had either a threat assessment or an allocation of resources to implement the strategy. And this can be critical, right? So one, one example is, is the experience of Nigeria, which recently released its national cybersecurity strategy and policy in 2021. I think in many ways, it is an exemplary document, but unfortunately it did not include dedicated resources to ensure its implementation, which has prevented the, the central coordinating committee that was meant to oversee the implementation of that strategy from being started. Next slide, please. Um, a final challenge and one that I know uh, my colleague, Dr. Jufa will talk at length about is an international cooperation and coordination. Um, by definition, cyber threats span borders and in order to effectively combat them, you need to agree on what constitutes a cyber crime. You need to share information uh, across countries. You need to have mutual legal assistance treaties and extradition treaties. And, and, uh, and, and those are and, and major cyber treaties are, are one of the main vehicles through which you can accomplish that. Unfortunately, there is pretty low ratification and adoption of the two major cybersecurity related treaties currently in existence. That's the European Union sponsored Budapest Convention and the African Union sponsored Malibu Convention. This chart shows that there are only three countries, uh, Senegal, Ghana, and Mauritius that have ratified both of those conventions. And this is a the big, big area that needs to be worked on. Um, one kind of final point before I end and, and turn things over to Nena. Um, to address cybersecurity challenges is going to require national cybersecurity strategy and policy and international cooperation, cooperation. But I think crucially, and for you as security sector actors, it's going to require efforts to adapt and use information technology to serve citizen security. Cyber-related threats are not just non-traditional because they are virtual, but because they challenge boundaries. And the only way to confront them effectively is through multi-stakeholder trust and cooperation between a variety of stakeholders. Um, civilian actors often make better cyber warriors than military actors, just because of their training and their expertise. And security sector actors often in attempting to control an information environment can harm the trust they need to be a, make it for effective policy. One example here is with respect to critical infrastructure protection, where it's really in everybody's interest for the private sector to report and disclose attacks, but they might not feel super comfortable um, for reputational reasons, et cetera, disclosing those attacks to government or security sector actors. Um, and finally, unlike many technologies, information technology is a technology that has the capacity to fundamentally change the social contract between the state and its citizens. And I worry that embracing technology for technology's sake, as I alluded to earlier, from smart cities to biometric ID systems as a way to respond to threats without thinking clearly about the relationship, uh, how this relationship is, is, is affecting citizen security, can be ineffective at best and counterproductive at worst. Um, final thought, uh, many African countries are at a critical juncture in their journey towards cyber maturity. And the decisions you make about how your countries use information technology will have repercussions for decades. And I think it will be up to you all as security sector leaders to leverage information technology in ways that ultimately make your countries and citizens more peaceful and more prosperous. You do that, and I think there's a really, really good chance that Africa's digital revolution will not go like the industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ne, for such an elaborate uh, conversation that you've already begun. Uh, let me give the floor to uh, Dr. Niema Ifianye Ajufo. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I feel very privileged 
to have been asked um, to discuss cyber threats in Africa with you all and greetings from the United Kingdom. Um, in the next few minutes, I will discuss the role that African security sector actors can play as part of a broader multi-stakeholder approach to address Africa's cyber-related threats. I would look at the national, regional, and international approaches to managing cyber threats, discuss the challenges that are being faced by the African security actors, particularly Dr. Nate has highlighted this fact. And I would also look at the Afri how African sector leaders um, can address cyber threats through leadership, policies, and institutions in various ways to leverage partnership with external actors. Um, can we have um, the slides, please? Um, the first slide, if it's available. Now, as regions continue to be digitalized, it is important to highlight the digital transformation agenda of Africa because Africa has begun exploring an agenda on digital transformation in relation to peace, in relation to security, and in relation to governance. Now, many of us may know about the African Digital Transformation Agenda 2020-2030. Following endorsement by the 2019 El Sheikh Declaration in February 2020, the African Union Commission decided to adopt a digital transformation strategy for Africa. Why is that strategy important to our discussion this morning? It's because the digital transformation strategy has highlighted the need for a greater capacity to detect and mitigate cyber attacks. And you can see that cybersecurity is one of the cross-cutting themes of digital transformation agenda in Africa. And according to that strategy, African government's responsibility to create an enabling environment with policy and regulations that promote digital transformation against foundation pillars, which include cybersecurity, is fundamental. Now, that strategy also states unequivocally that collaborative ICT regulatory measures are the tools and the new frontier for regulators and policymakers to work towards maximizing opportunities afforded by digital transformation. Now, indeed, agreeably, the digital transformation agenda offers Africa tremendous opportunities. However, effective and efficient digital transformation in Africa can only happen in a trusted and secure cyberspace. And this cuts across the digital economy, it cuts across development, it cuts across employment, it cuts across all various issues that can lead to advancing Africa. Can I have the second slide as well? Now, it's also important to look at cooperation and coordination in addressing Africa's cyber-related threats and the African Union initiatives. African Union has been making so many efforts. Now, since the adoption of the Malabo Convention, which I'll talk about briefly and Nate had highlighted, the African Union Commission has been organizing cybersecurity capacity building workshops including in collaboration with key partners, international and regional economic communities, and even member states to promote cybersecurity culture. Now, many of those initiatives are not being fully undertaken or taken advantage of by many member states. Now, the AUC also in 2017, in cooperation with the Internet Society, developed guidelines on security of internet infrastructure in Africa. Sometimes you find that many African states still do not understand, just like Nate pointed out, the standards for you know, protecting critical infrastructure in Africa. Again, the African Union in 2020, uh, 2019 appointed the African Union Cybersecurity Experts Group, composed of 10 members representing all the African regions with the sole mission of advising African member states and African Union Commission on cybersecurity matters. Another important step that has been taken by the African Union Commission in collaboration with partners like the US European Union is the launching of the Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa, PRIDA. PRIDA has been working with the 55 AU member states on internet governance and cybersecurity and cyber resilience matters as one of its critical mandates. Now that brings me to the core regulations and legislations focused on enhancing cybersecurity, both regionally and internationally. In 2014, the African Union Commission adopted the Malabo Convention, which is the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. 
So far, that convention has not, re has not received the required number of ratifications for it to go into force. As we speak, only 11 countries have made the move and it does not have the required 15 ratifications for it to come into force. So as it is today, member states in Africa lack a harmonized framework to effectively respond to challenges posed by cyber threats. In this age of cyber uncertainties, the ratification of that convention will be a huge and major step towards an African regional stability in terms of cybersecurity. As Nate highlighted as well, there is the Budapest Convention, which is the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime. Again, that convention is drafted with a focus on harmonizing laws and increasing international cooperation, which is needed for cybersecurity. So far, only very few numbers of African states have ratified that convention. And like Nate pointed out, only Ghana, Senegal, Mauritius have, have ratified the Malabo Convention and the Budapest Convention. I believe we can do better. It's been 20 years since the Budapest Convention, and yet very few African countries have ratified. Again, um, you have the United Nations norms on responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Throughout the process, only about eight African countries were involved, particularly Kenya, Egypt, and South Africa were at the forefront of the process. Now, those norms are important to give a standard for any state as to how states can behave responsibly and show accountability, even in policing cyber threats. Now, a huge effort that is going on presently, and member states are in Vienna, as we speak, based on this effort, is the UN Global Convention on Cybersecurity. Impressively, many African countries are at the fore in terms of pushing the convention, particularly Nigeria takes up one of the seats of the vice chair seats. You have countries like Algeria and so many other states at the forefront to see that we have a UN global convention on cybersecurity. This is important because as we discuss security in Africa, we must think about cybersecurity. The internet, cyberspace is not tied to any geographically proximate location. In the past, when you think about security, you think about regional borders, geographical borders. But in terms of cybersecurity, you cannot limit security to just your borders because the effects of cyber criminal activities go beyond traditional borders. So, and so we can also discuss Africa's security sector approaches to emerging cyber threats, if we go to the next slide. Some of the challenges you find is the lack of understanding of the threat landscape. And that was why I found Nate's presentation very interesting. Most times you find that in the African region, when you think about cybercrime, there's usually a focus on fraud, economic activities, but then it goes beyond just fraud and economic activities. And this lack of understanding of the threat landscape reflects on the legal framework. And so you find that without that united and cooperative agenda, it also reflects in how we tackle cyber threats in the region. As I mentioned, cybercrime is embedded across borders and it must be treated as such. It is essential for the security sector and even the criminal justice authority to speak the same language in understanding the threat landscape. There is also a problem with the definition of issues. If you pick up all the cybercrime legislations in Africa, you would not see an understanding of issues like espionage, ransomware, just like Nate had pointed out. And so you find that at the, particular, at the political level, there may be a lack of a full understanding and appreciation of the importance of involved investing resources, investing cooperation in cybersecurity, particularly due to the need to balance different security priorities. So you find that cybersecurity is generally not prioritized. In the whole of Africa, Kenya is one country that understands that, for example, election is critical infrastructure. There is also a lack of understanding of what forms critical infrastructure. The Kenyan elections will hold in August, the general elections. Kenya identifies election as critical infrastructure. And a few weeks back, there was news on how the electoral technology system had been attacked. As Nate pointed out as well, not every African country has certificate uh, uh, computer, em sorry, computer emergency response teams set up. It also reflects on institutional measures. If you look at Article 27, it is not being taken advantage of. So this reflects on so many challenges. Again, African states under-resourced institutions, which also lack 
technical skills, capacity, financial resources to effectively implement cyber policies and enforcement measures is a problem. Many times you also find that the reality of cybersecurity collides with the reality of developing states, particularly for states in Africa, which lack adequate digital capacity, lack the digital skills, and lack the infrastructure to effectively ensure cybersecurity at global standards. And you find that that is an issue with so many of African states. I would come to cybercrime legislations. There is usually a problem sometimes with having the appropriate cybercrime legislations, and a core issue has been balancing human rights. And this is because sometimes we think that cybercrime is importantly and only a security issue. Like Nate pointed out towards the end of his discussion, we must think beyond just the security sector. In 2020, for example, the ECOWAS court asked the Nigerian government to either repeal or amend its cybercrime legislation because of Article 24, which was poised to breach human rights obligation if it is effectively used. You find that that is also an issue when you come to Kenya, you come to Zimbabwe. We need to understand and define appropriately what we want to see in cybercrime legislations and adopt best practices. Again, Nate pointed out to the fact that many countries have no cybersecurity strategy. And I want to take it to the African Union level. Regionally, we do not have a cybersecurity strategy, and that is a challenge. Cooperation at national and pan-African level is necessary to effectively prepare, but also respond to cyber threats and cyber attacks. And so a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy nationally and even regionally would be an important step in that direction. And I would ask, in the midst of some of these challenges highlighted, what are the role of actors in addressing cyber threats? Are we only looking at security sector actors? Who are the main actors and institutions involved in responding to cyber threats? Is there a role for actors other than security actors? Is there a role for actors other than state actors? And can we go to the second slide, please? How can security sector actors work as part of a multi-stakeholder approach? Now, to effectively ensure cybersecurity, there is a need for multi-stakeholder engagement. It is imperative for governments, for criminal justice authorities, the security sector, private sector, civil society, and all actors to work together to effectively and efficiently address the issue of cybercrime. The Malabo Convention, which is our own African Union Convention for Cybersecurity, underscores this in Article 26. When it talks about a cybersecurity culture, it talks about the need for public-private and partnership, it also talks about the need for you know, appropriate institutions for education, for awareness. This is very important. So when we think of cyber threats, they are not only connected to just um, national security. They are mainly connected to criminal activities that target ICT networks, where you have citizens, you have businesses, you have national interest at stake, not just national security. And so to achieve cyber resilience and effective cyber threat response capabilities at all levels, we must think about the private sector, national and regional bodies who must play an essential role in fighting against these threats. The nature of cyberspace must cause us to think of responses that transcend the, national, the traditional notions of security. Yes, the security sector, the defense sector tends to be the main actor, but there are other arms of society that contribute to the promotion and protection of a global, open, and secure cyberspace. And so that is why, although the security sector has the role of managing security incidents within the state borders, an effective cybersecurity approach should underscore the role and responsibility of the security sector, as well as its relationship with national, public, and private stakeholders in the national cybersecurity landscape. I say this because a lack of such approach will continue to be an impediment to the relevant sectors and stakeholders to operate effectively because they are not legally mandated to do so. In fact, if you look at um, the norm 13 of the norms of responsible state behavior, it underscores states to cooperate in developing and applying measures to increase stability and security. 
Can we go to the last, the fifth slide, please? Now, how do we leverage partnerships with external actors within the African security sector to ensure cybersecurity? And I think there are four issues that underscore this leadership, institutions, laws and policies, and of course, international cooperation. And that is why we are here today. Many times you find that the discussion of policing cyber threats in Africa hardly focuses on leadership. But you know, most forums you attend, it mostly focuses on legislations, conventions, and institutions. Having a regulatory framework and the required institutions in place will not automatically resolve the ever-growing cyber threats within the AU boundaries. What needs to be taken into consideration when we assess cyber threats as a region, amongst others includes the human resources, the processes, the procedures, the political and legal framework, and the technology and infrastructure. In general, you find that leadership transcends the security sector. It involves parliamentarians, diplomats, skilled experts in cybersecurity, ministries, we must think about the skilled IT personnel who are hard to find. It is always difficult to find the skilled IT security personnel. So it is important that we find the right balance between the deep technical activity and the high level policy driven ambitions. It is important that we ensure that cybersecurity personnel are not only skilled in their fields, but are also capable of making high impact decisions when it comes to managing cyber threats. So good leadership oversight and clearly defined roles and responsibilities that underscore private public cooperation and partnership through a multi-stakeholder approach could help us as a region to mitigate cyber threats. In terms of institutions, we've talked overly about critical infrastructure, cybersecurity authorities, national agencies, However, we must also address operational and organizational capabilities. These capabilities cover resources, infrastructure, and even service delivery when we think of the private sector and ensuring that we have cyber incident response in a 24 hour, seven days a week mode. And so there must be a baseline understanding of institutional mechanisms and procedures for communication, like Ned said, sharing of information between national public and private stakeholders. There are so many institutional initiatives like AFRIPO. AFRIPO is, has been in partnership with the African Union Commission and so many states. We can also think of having an African Union Agency for Cybersecurity, which will help the region just like you have in the European Union. It is important that we keep having computer emergency response teams. However, beyond that, we must think of sectoral sets. In Ghana, Ghana has sectoral certificate and computer emergency response teams. Those sort of sectoral sets help even beyond just the national security level. We must also ensure that where you have technical level experts, there is also free flow of information. We must think of ministries. In Nigeria, a member of the Ministry of Justice has been at the forefront and is heading the Nigerian initiative at the Global Cybercrime Convention process. Ministries can undertake coordination. In Ghana as well, the Cybersecurity Authority is embedded in the national, um, in the Ministry of Communications and Information Authority. So ministries also have a role to play, not just the security sector. We've talked about policy. I don't want to keep humming, um, happening on policies. However, I just want to say that governments should be responsive in creating an environment that supports private sector initiatives and opportunities to seek mutual assistance by reducing regulatory obstacles. Sometimes the laws we make in pursuing and promoting cybersecurity can stifle private bodies from effectively working in the cybersecurity sectors. Laws must have a balance. We must ensure a balance in terms of a multi-stakeholder approach and promote cooperation for cyber security. Lastly, in terms of international cooperation, again, like I said, cyber activities go beyond national borders and Africa must ensure cooperation through encouraging the development of compatible and harmonized cybersecurity laws. There are so many digital cooperation initiatives going on, and I will talk about the US first. 
The US mission to the African Union has been training law enforcement officials, security sector actors across the 55 member states. I've been opportunity to be invited to um, participate in one of the training sessions. The US government every year provides for the International Visitors Leadership Program, where you have members from African states participate in that exchange. And this year, I was also privileged to participate in one of those sessions. You also have the EU that has been making efforts through the African Union and the European Union Summit. This year as well, there was one. There is the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise and the GFCE has been driving various cooperation efforts with the African Union. The Interpol as well has the support program for the African Union and cybercrime is one of the core areas of the partnership. You also have the U United Kingdom also working in so many capacity building efforts. And recently the UK government in partnership with Morocco launched the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence for Africa. The Council of Europe, through the um, Council of Europe, which um, promulgated the Budapest Convention, sponsors the Cybercrime Forum every year since 2019, 2018 rather, to see that African member states ratify the convention, but also prioritize cybersecurity. It is important that AU member states take advantage of these cooperation initiatives and utilize them in terms of international cooperation. The only caveat I want to add, playing the devil's advocate, is that in terms of digital cooperation, international cooperation, it is important that cooperation takes place on Africa's stems. We must prioritize what we need as Africans, think about our culture, think about our reality. And in terms of cooperation, we must think of digital equality, because if there is no equality, if there is no measure of equal standard in terms of digital infrastructure, cyber strategies, cyber mechanisms, then international cooperation may just be illusory because at the end of the day, we go back to our regions and we still lack the basic infrastructure and strategies to ensure cyber security. The last slide. Finally, I just want to summarize it all by saying that, yes, indeed, while governments, while the security sector mostly create and develop cybersecurity initiatives, it is important to consult technical experts, private businesses, and civil society for recommendations on how to improve strategies. Why is this important? The private sector companies, including the internet service providers and the IT sector, are crucial because of their role in creating and maintaining the technologies on which cybersecurity issues arise. The technical community is important because they have the technical expertise and the understanding of the internet. And they are often cited by governments you know, in the global north when developing cybersecurity policies. We can also do the same in Africa. Finally, we can never stop emphasizing the role of civil society organizations who are uniquely positioned to advocate for cybersecurity policies. They find a balance in telling us that this is what will be beneficial in terms of pursuing a people-centered approach to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is not just about the security sector. Yes, it is important, but we must think about victims. We must think about a people-centered approach because networks are not just defined by borders and territory. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Fianya uh, Jufo. Uh, we have a lot to unpack here in our discussion groups. Uh, let me highlight some of the few points uh, that Dr. Uh, Nate Allen and Dr. Uh, Fianyu Ajufo uh, uh, presented. So Nate started by uh, discussing the four types of cyber threats. So Nate talked about the organized crime, critical infrastructure, infrastructure sabotage, cyber espionage, combat innovation. Uh, he discussed a few other uh, uh, he noted that we need to think about the advantages and disadvantages of technology that we acquire as Africans to address the issues of cyber threats. Uh, he talked about the fact that while most countries have cyber security strategies, or many countries have cyber security strategies, they do not have the, the threat assessment and do not have uh, uh, sufficient resources for the implementation of this strategy. Uh, Dr. Uh, if you are uh, on the other side, talked about the digital transformation strategy for Africa. Uh, she discussed the fact that the digital transformation strategy in Africa can only happen in a safe cyberspace. In terms of uh, some of the challenges she addressed, she talked about a lack of understanding of the threat uh, landscape, 
She talked about the definition of issues. She talked about the cybersecurity is not prioritized by many African countries. She talked about the lack of appropriate cybercrime legislation and then the lack of appropriate cybersecurity strategies. In terms of solutions, she talks about the need for countries to draft national cybersecurity strategies. She talked about the need for uh, an African regional and continental strategy and the need for private public partnerships in addressing some of the cyber threats that, uh, that we just discussed. She talked about the citizen and public uh, awareness. The key words that I'm picking up from all this conversation, and I think uh, right after that we can go into the question and answers, are leadership, laws, policies, institutions, cooperation, coordination, partnership, and above all, she talked about people, civil society organizations have to be involved. The security sector is not just about the military, it's also about the civilian in the security sector. Thank you.